morning and welcome to um, our first session today um, uh, focusing on water reuse. I'm really excited to be here and kicking off the conference um, on this topic. Um, so for those of you that are just can't get enough water reuse content, I'd like to take a moment to plug the full Water Reuse Association sponsored track tomorrow on Tuesday. Um, hopefully see some of you over there. Our first presentation this morning is titled Sustainably Protecting Local Water Supplies by Recharging Aquifers with MBR Affluent. Our speakers this morning are Hiro Kuge. Hiro is a technology manager of Kubota Membrane USA and is char in charge of membrane bioreactor design, technical service, and regional sales. He has been working with municipal and industrial wastewater treatment design, system integration, project management, construction, commissioning, operation, and troubleshooting for over 18 years. He has designed, commissioned, and serviced multiple MBR plants in North America in the past 12 years. And Amber Mummert, who is the wastewater treatment plant manager for Alani Casino and Resort. She's been with Alani since pre-opening and accepted the job because she believes in the indirect aquifer recharge project. She's been in the water and wastewater industry for 20 years. She believes as professionals, we have the responsibility to protect our most vital resource for future generations. She loves coaching and passing on knowledge to newer operators, always with the goal in mind to pass on her passion for the profession. And Mike Ollivant. Mike's experience includes a variety of wastewater and water reclamation projects and leadership positions over the last 43 years as an engineering consultant. Mike has been actively engaged in PNCWA activities to include conference chair, past president of PNCWA, vice chair of the government, governmental affairs committee, and participant in the National Water Policy Fund. Welcome to our speakers. Good morning, everybody. Interesting, the monitor is not advancing. Okay, we'll do this by, by remembering. Um, so my perception today was I would be in a little tiny room with a few people. And then we checked the room number and we're going, isn't that the one for opening session? So we're glad we're having so much, um, so many participants. Uh, we have a great uh, presentation today. And like my perception that I'd be in a small room, we also, when we started this project, there was a perception that vertical Vado zone wells in the Northwest really don't make sense, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. So some project background. So this system is located on the Calis Tribal Reservation, and it's for uh, really to serve a 152 acre reservation and also the um, ALNA, and it's not spelled that way, ALNA uh, Resort and Casino. Uh, it is located a little bit north of Vancouver, Washington. And if you know where La Center is, it's kind of directly west on I-5 uh, from that community. So because it's a uh, tribal reservation, it is tribal trust land. So tribal trust land means it's under the jurisdiction of the United States government. And it also fits into, uh, it's uh, under the jurisdiction of EPA because it's a trust land. It is considered a class five injection well um, and is rule authorized or authorization by rule under the CFR. We've got the CFR up there if anybody Here's to dig into the detail. So under that regulation or under that CFR, the bottom line is uh, the reclaimed water has to meet federal drinking water, primary drinking water standards at the point of compliance. For this particular project, because it received a lot of scrutiny, EPA Region 10 said, as soon as that Reclaimed water begins to recharge the aquifer. That is where we're going to sample. And that's where you have to meet that point of compliance. So what was really important on this project is to have a water reclamation system that could consistently meet 
very high quality effluent and those federal drinking water standards prior to injection for the betterment of groundwater and also just for the operation system. Now you don't have to meet those standards under the CFR uh, at the end of the plant process. You still have the VATO zone. So EPA still considers treatment in the VATO zone as part of the treatment process. However, if you've already done your job before the injection activities, so much the better. At this particular site, it um, presented a unique challenge. The first 60 to 80 feet of the soil was basically impervious. But Mother Nature uh, blessed the tribes with a very deep aquifer, which allowed vertical vato zone injection wells to be used on this site. And I believe it's maybe only the second time in Washington State that it had actually been empty. So it was really important that the water reclamation facility produce consistent, high quality effluent for not only to meet the federal requirements, but also for protection of the well. And both Kiro and Amber are going to talk much more detail into the process. And they're going to talk more about why it's important when you have a vertical VATO zone injection well of having very high quality effluent. So this, again, this is considered a class five injection well under the underground injection control program that's regulated by EPA. These injection wells are 160 feet deep with the screen set at 80 to 155 feet below ground. So they're, they're quite deep. Groundwater's a depth of 240 feet. So even below the lowest point of the screened vertical well, there's still 80 feet of VATO zone that provides additional treatment prior to the uh, reclaimed water re-entering and recharging the aquifer. Seven wells were drilled. And if you can see up there, the dots in red are the drilled wells. I don't know if you can see that or not. Everybody big enough? Getting vertical nods. Uh, and then there's four additional wells that will be drilled in the future in order to have adequate capacity. Only two of those are actually active. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. All these wells are located in the parking lot of the resort casino. So if you happen to be there, so who's ever been to the ALNA casino resort? Anybody? Who's lost money there? I have. Uh, who's lost money at the casino? Thank you very much for your sponsorship, by the way. Amber really appreciates it because it keeps her employed. So please go to the casino and lose money. And flush twice. Anyway. So, but these are located in the parking lot. All they are is a utility vault. Um, you know, we try to make sure cars aren't parked on top of the utility vault. So if you do have to get to them, you can, but otherwise they're, you, you would not know that they're actually in, in the area. So it doesn't use up any extra uh, property. So a little bit about the actual injection well. And I won't go into too much detail here. We, we have a question and answer session at the end. And then anybody that does have questions, there's a microphone in the middle. So just come up to the microphone, give us your name and your affiliation and your question, and then we'll do our best job to answer. So out of the seven wells that were drilled, and these are 12 inch diameter screened wells, two are active. One is used throughout the week, and then the second well is used during the weekend because they have high peak flows. In vertical beta zone injection wells are in a saturated condition, so they can't take a lot of peak flows. Amber's gonna talk more about that today. So three of the wells that were drilled are on standby. So they're just there. Uh, you don't rotate through the wells, you use them until they are no longer serviceable. We have one smaller emergency well we use to actually do the hydrogeology analysis. 
And then we had one well that actually we believe got smeared in the process of drilling it. And so it wasn't, it didn't have adequate capacity so that the equipment was not put in it. When you use vertical vadosone injection wells, you assume that you're going to have to re-drill the well about every five to seven years. Now you're not having to move it far. You may like to use it 10 feet, re-drill it, put your equipment back in it, but about every five to 10 feet or every five to 10 years, you will have to uh, re-drill that well. Each well is equipped, equipped with what they call a V-smart valve. And the V-smart valve prevents the, the reclaimed water from cascading down the pipe in training a bunch of air bubbles and then putting those air bubbles into the vadosome, which effectively airlocks the, va the vadosome. So you have to have this very quiescent um, injection of the reclaimed water into these wells. Um, I could go through the details of how that works if you got a question, but basically it's an outer sleeve over the top of the pipe. It's operated by use of a pump and some hydraulic hoses that are filled with vegetable oil, by the way, in case one leaks. Uh, and then if, as you open up that sleeve, it exposes some holes and more water, more reclaimed water goes in as well. The other thing that's really important is, as I, as I already mentioned, is you need to have a very good control system so that your the water going into the wells is very constant because you're in a saturated condition. This is not a rapid infiltration basin. This is not a vertical drain field. You can't hammer it and think it's just going to store it and it'll go away. That is not the way these work. They got to have consistent flow. So, um, and Amber will talk more about that as we get started. So, with that, we're going to have Hero talk more about why it's so important to have a very robust water reclamation uh, process ahead of the vertical basal cell. Thank you, Mike. Um, so Amber is gonna talk about the, about the facility itself, but I would like to um, go over about the MBR itself. So uh, MBR, membrane bioreactive process. Um, just want to go over, I mean, if you already know about this, I'm sorry, but I would like to go over about what the MBRs can do. Now, a uh, typical uh, wastewater stream plot process, a lot of process around the world is still a conventional active sludge process. Um, you have primary clarifier, and then you have aeration tank and a final clarifier. And uh, aeration tank would typically have mixed liquors, suspended solids of uh, around 3,000. Now, I have to say one joke that I always say, I'm sorry about this if you heard this before, but um, I'm originally from Japan and um, you know, some Japanese people likes to start with a beer and they go with sake and they go with wine and they mix all the liquor in your stomach. Sorry, this is a little, sometimes they say they love the mixed liquor, but um, anyway, MBR can operate with a very high mixed liquor. Um, we go in sometimes in between 10,000 to 15,000 and um, uh, because we have a physical separation by a filter. So we put the membrane into the aeration tank and we physically separate the solids and the clean water with the membrane. So, you know, whenever I talk with the operator of the conventional system, sometimes, you know, the operator need to come at the nighttime and they have to add some chemicals when the uh, settling process of the clarifier doesn't go very well. Like if there, if there is a filamentous bacteria grown, you know, the settling doesn't go very well and some of the suspended solids will leak out to the creeks. And so, um, they have to, you know, get to the plant at the nighttime, um, and a lot of things to do. But with the membrane, we don't really need to worry about that because it's a physical separation by the filter. And uh, we can get rid of the primary or, or the flat final clarifier. Um, Sometimes we can repurpose those clarifiers into an equalization tank or solids handling tank. Um, and um, the other benefit that we have is we can really operate with high mixed liquor so we can reduce the footprint or total volume quite a bit. And the MBR effluent is also very well known as a very clean effluent. Now, if you need a, any tertiary treatment after the conventional process, uh, you need some kind of membrane um, afterwards. And um, 
But the membrane bioreactor is pretty much a combination of the secondary and the tertiary process into one kind of a process. And so um, it is very efficient as a total uh, process. Uh, if you look at the effluent, um, effluent is again very well known as a very clean effluent. Um, one of the things I really enjoy doing this work for 18 years is when I start up the plant, um, we put the clean effluent from the MBR into a beaker or into a bottle of like a like a bottle of water, and we really bring some other bottle of water right next to. But it's kind of pretty much identical. It looks pretty clean. Um, the MBR effluent. Maybe Amber can talk a little bit more about this, but um, anyway. The effluent is uh, often reused and um, around the world, uh, we use it for golf course irrigation. Um, Sometimes we have a building that treats the wastewater at the very basement, um, like OHSU building, uh, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. They have MBR at the basement and they recycle the water back to flush the toilet. With flushing the toilet, you don't really need to have drinking water. And if you can use the MBR effluent, um, you can save some water. And so it is reused uh, quite often. Now in the market, there is two type of membrane. We're using this flat plate membrane and um, uh, Calitz uses the flat plate membrane. So we're gonna be talking about this flat plate membrane. I, I work for a company called Kubota. So let me talk a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit, but um, we do some small package plants like the picture on the left to a very big plant like the picture on the right. The picture on the left is Snoqualmie Pass. Uh, it's 20,000 gallon per day uh, package plant. We provide it. Um, and the picture on the right is Canton, Ohio, where there is a football hall of fame. And that plant is 42 MGD, max monthly flow with a peak capacity of 88 MGD, which is the largest MBR in the, in the country. Uh, but why are these places are using flat plate membrane? Um, simple answers. <laughs> One big answer is it is a simple operation and maintenance. And the flat plate membrane is very well known for a simple operation and maintenance. Now our membrane are equally spaced and this even space in between the plates are the key factor for our success that we had in the past 30 years. This equal spacing in between the plates are very important to keep the air scour velocity even um, in between the plates. Let me show you how this, um, how the membrane is working. I wanna stop the video at about 17 seconds, but the membrane cassette will hold this membrane cartridges and each membrane cartridge have a membrane sheet on both ends. The membrane have about 0.2 micron pore size. Stop here. Um, now the membrane, ah, sorry, just want to go a little bit more. Just a little bit more. The lights. Oh yeah, there we go. Please stop there. Oop. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, but uh, the membrane is categorized as a MF membrane. The pore size, average pore size is 0.2 micron. But for the wastewater treatment system, this 0.2 micron is a good uh, enough size for the wastewater treatment. Um, what is the size of activated, sl activated sludge block? You know, it's 20 micron or 50 micron or 70 micron. So if you have 0.2 micron, it is enough. Um, same with the bacteria, it is bigger than one micron. So if you, again, if you have 0.2 micron, it removes all the bacteria and suspended solids. Now we have also done a lot of virus removal study in the past three years, and it does have about, have about 4.5 log removal. Uh, it was, uh, the oldest study was done in California and presented at WEFTEC and every other places with our membrane. And so um, uh, it is very well known that, and, and for, uh, for bacteria wise, there's about six log removal, uh, somewhere in between five to six log removal. So it does remove quite a bit of um, uh, materials. Okay, can you please go on? Thank you. So uh, yeah, and, and there's not a very specific definition on the MF versus UF. It, you know, if you look at the textbook, it overwraps. So it's not the definition. What matters is the good removal of uh, biological sludge and the bacteria. Now, sometimes we have these cassettes uh, double stacked 
Um, some plants, places, small plants, we have EQ tanks. Some places we don't. We have a pre-aeration tank and the MBR tank. NBR tank is an also aeration tank. So we have a blower that supplies the air to the system. And there's an aeration underneath the membrane. We call this air scour. And this air is a key factor to avoid the membrane from fouling. Um, and it, it, it is a continuous air. And these are how the membrane surface is cleaned. Um, um, continuously. In the sludge, we have, again, the sludge flock. We have a lot of bacteria, but those are not going to go through the membrane sheet. Only the clean water will go through the membrane sheet. And so, um, again, the effluent suspended solids are pretty much non detect level. The bacteria is also non detecting the effluent. So what happens if we use for a very long time? Uh, gradually, the membranes will start fouling and uh, there will be some of the sludge uh, on the surface of the membrane and we have to do chemical cleaning when those happens. Uh, the water uh, in the typical usage, water will be collected at the tube and will be collected at the manifold pipings and then it goes to the header pipings and then to the permeate pumps. Now, some of the plants we have, um, we do not have any permeate pumps and we just use a static head of the membrane tank water level, push the water out. Uh, there's a plant called Wapito right next to Yakama. And that plant is operating for five years, but if you go to the plant, there's no pumps. Um, the pipings will penetrate through the, through the wall and it will gravity filtrate the water through the membrane. So um, please go to the next, or push this, yeah. Let me, um, work on this. Okay. Yeah, this is the actual uh, video of how it is aerated. Uh, now, uh, um, we put the membrane into a clean water, clear case. We took the side panels off, and you can see that the air scour is cleaning the surface very efficiently. Um, And uh, the chemical cleaning process is another process that I would like to introduce. But uh, when the membrane is fouled, you will have uh, sodium hypochloride, uh, half percent uh, back injected to the membrane. And that's how we clean the membrane. So um, uh, Amber has some picture on the actual Kellett's uh, project chemical cleaning process, but it is a very simple backflow process to the membrane, typically once every three to six months. And this process takes typically two to four hours. Some pl plants do overnight or a little longer, but um, you pretty much just uh, backflow the chemical into the membrane cassette. You do not need to drain in the sludge and the membrane will be cleaned. Um, the solids on the surface or in the pores would be dissolved. And then after that, after two to four hours of reaction, you could put the process back online. Um, when do we do uh, chemical cleaning? Um, we typically do every three to six months when the transmembrane pressure, this kind of indicates how much fouling you have on the surface of the membrane. Pretty much our maximum transmembrane pressure is about three PSI, but a lot of plants, when it's up to about one PSI or one PSI of increase, or some plants half PSI of increase, they go to uh, chemical cleaning. Um, so, that's pretty much about it of the general process of MBR. And now Amber can talk uh, about the detail of the Calitz plant. All right, can everybody hear me? So the facility outline is parametrics. Mike here, uh, engineer designed the plant. Um, Commissioned in April of 2017. That's when the casino opened. Construction cost was about 13 and a half million. Uh, we, our current capacity is 195,000 gallons a day. Um, we primarily, the reservation isn't completely built out yet. So we primarily, the casino is the biggest close we get. There's a couple other little buildings right now, but not much. We have uh, two trains that are fully operational and then two trains that are empty 
for future expansion up to that 390,000 gallons a day. We meet plus a reclaimed water standard. How well you can see that, but there's kind of the layout of the tank. Um, the ones on the left there are the ones that are operational. On the right, that's for future expansion. So the water comes into the headworks, um, then goes through the screening process and to a influent wet well, which then pumps over to the mixed liquor return channel, which flows into the anoxic tank. Then there's feed forward pumps below that that pump from the anoxic tank to the aeration tanks um, based on level of the anoxic tank and then the, or based on flow coming in, sorry. And then the permeate pumps will pull through uh, the plant based on the level of the anoxic tank. Gravity flows from the aeration tank to the MBR tank. There is, that's the beginning of construction, as Mike stated, we're just north of Vancouver. It's only 152 acre reservation. It's pretty small as far as reservations go in this state. Um, if there is room for growth, uh, the tribe has been buying up more land, so it will be bigger. It actually already is a little bit bigger than that, but not much. Um, but if it, it's they're buying connected land, you gotta buy it and sell it back to the government, put it in trust, that's the way it works. Um, so they're working on that. And then as they gain more land, they will put more stuff on the reservation and we'll be able to expand the plant. That big uh, round tank in the back there, that is the reclaimed water storage tank. Very important, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Nice rebar and concrete with normal construction. <laughs> There's an overhead view of the operations building and the tanks in the back of it there. There's the, the finished product. Um, obviously, the headworks is that building to the north of the big building, the finished product. So we use um, their Huber rotary drum screens. They have two mil millimeter perforations. Um, as you can imagine, uh, taking most of our influence from a casino, we have a lot of interesting stuff that comes through. Um, these two millimeter screens, we have not had a problem with anything making it through them. We do have to empty those bags every day, otherwise um, very, very heavy. And there's the anoxic and the aeration tank. Your tank layout. So we have four cassettes in each train um, and the operational trains right now. Here's the permeate pumps that are taking from pulling through the membranes and pushing to that reclaimed water tank for storage. have airs and blowers with the enclosures, which is really nice because it's not glaringly loud when you walk into the operations portion of the building. Um, Parametrics did a great job designing uh, with a ton of redundancy. So we have, for every piece of equipment, we have one for each train and then a standby that we can move to when we do maintenance or have an issue. This is the CIP system, clean in place. Um, we clean our membranes every six months. Our TMP has never um, told us to clean them. Um, we've just done it precautionary uh, when the weather changes. Typically when we do it, um, when it's getting warm and when it's getting cold. Uh, we just have those 60 gallon barrels of sodium hypochlorite, um, set the rotometer to the correct flow and let it go. We let ours sit for four hours and we've just found that that's, we feel better about it. Um, <clears throat> then we do do a flush, we flush the line afterwards with just um, 
reclaim water uh, just to clean the hypo out of the lines when we're finished. Our effluent quality, uh, we our removal, we're usually 99.8% removal on BOD and TSS is typical of us. Uh, I don't think we've ever been below 99%. Um, we very, very rarely have a coliform hit, uh, which is really not detectable. Our ammonia runs low. Turbidity is typically between 0.05 and 0.15 NTUs. We are usually stay at about 0.09. We've been at 0.09, 0.1 for three months, um, pretty consistently. And our effluent typically does meet uh, primary drinking water standards. Um, the vast majority of the time, we're meeting it before we even send it to the beta zone. Some operational considerations um, for mostly for the vertical injection wells is do have to have really consistent effluent flow, which means you have to be able to forecast your influent flow really well. So I wouldn't recommend it if you have a high I and I situation or anything like that. Um, we know the capacity of the casino. We know when we're going to be busy and when we're not. We know when promotions are. Like, so we can tell when our flows are going to be high and we can adjust our reclaim tank according to that to leave more room or, or leave less capacity in there for slower days. Um, yeah, and uh, you need to, the, the flow to the well, I mean, we flow um, typically 60 gallons a minute, it, between 50 and 60 gallons a minute to the well. Um, that allows us to just keep that flow 24-7. Um, we have had to shut them, like, obviously COVID, when the casino shut down, um, the well shut down too. Um, the when we first started up, you know, we were hit really, really big with the uh, people going to spend their bunch of money, and then business slowed down a little bit, and then we had to adjust, you know, how we operated everything due to that. Uh, because we are a casino, we, like I said before, you get all sorts of interesting stuff in your influence. Um, coming in, and we have had plenty of ragging issues due to that. Um, mostly underwear. Uh, kind of an interesting note there. Um, from what we could gather, <laughs> was uh, we the casino would hold these promotions that you had to be sitting at a machine activated for when a drawing, right? Thousand bucks an hour or whatever. So people would not leave their machines and then end up flushing their soiled garments. <laughs> a little unique. Uh, <laughs> we don't rotate wells. We have, um, we've used one that, we started with one that we had um, quite a few mechanical issues with um, after a couple years. And so we shifted to the backup that we were using at that point and we've been on that well um, since then. Uh, we do have we uh, open up a backup well, like Mike said, uh, during the weekends, um, just for the high flows, and that way we can keep that flow through the wells consistent. Uh, the safety considerations is we go down into the vault of the well uh, every two weeks to test the chlorine residual to make sure that we are um, where we need to be. Uh, if something's building up in the distribution pipe or whatever, right? Um, and and that's another thing. We need to keep the chlorine residual extremely low. Um, we run it. We have found that at about a 0.2 milligrams per liter is perfect for um, keeping the, the 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 well clean and full disinfection and not causing disinfection byproducts. Like there's a lot of considerations just with the disinfection. Um, also, we do have uh, monitoring wells on the site that we are required by the EPA to get samples of. Uh, we're down to once a year now, it was twice a year, um, and then send them to a third party lab for primary drinking water testing. 
and then the uh, the last consideration would be line of sight. We have a radio antenna at the plant, and we have a repeater halfway between the plant and the parking lot. Then each um, each control box for the wells uh, has two controls two wells, and those have antennas on top of them as well. So if those can't communicate, you can't operate the wells remotely. You can go down there and do it, but it's a heck of a lot easier to be able to do it from your SCADA system. Anybody want to taste? I've tasted it. It's a, it's a little earthy, pairs well with bologna sandwich. That's it. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Amber. So as Mike alluded to earlier, if you'd like to ask a question, please come to the microphone in the middle so that our virtual attendees can hear your question as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jason Herman with the New Mexico Environment Department. I was wondering if you guys did any geocompatibility studies for the aquifer that you were going into as well as the uh, injection water that you were doing. Geocompatibility and hydrocompatibility for the aquifer that you're going into, as well as the water that you were injecting. Do you study any of the compatibility between those two waters? Yeah, I'm not sure that we, so the hydrogeology study was primarily uh, quantity rather than for quality, uh, if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Good morning. I'm John Priggy from JRO Simplot Company. I was wondering about pretreatment for FOG because my system that I'm more familiar with yours, um, fog is a problem. Fog? Free soil. Again, our situation is pretty unique because we primarily just serve the casino. Um, and we have grease traps uh, at every restaurant within the casino. And just actually, we ended up putting in an oversized grease trap. There's a food court in, um, at that food court area because we were having fog issues too. But the membranes took care of the majority of that. Um, since we've put in that oversized grease trap, um, our TMP is a lot lower. Uh, so we think some of it was getting through. And obviously, people still will dump some down the sink when they're not supposed to, right? So we get a little bit, but our grease is, is much lower since putting in that oversized trap. That's the, only, that's the only thing we do to combat it. Hi, I'm Dottie Ramey with the City of Vancouver, Washington. I have two questions. The first is for you, Amber. How do you manage your solids from the, okay. the treatment? Um, okay, so we have um, we have a solids tank that hold that we waste to. Uh, we run about um, we run between ten and twelve thousand uh, mixed liquor, and then once we send it to that tank, we decant it, and we don't have any solids processing on site. So we thicken it up to between 1.5 and 2% as much as we can, and then we send it to the city of the center for processing. Um, we don't have a biosolids permit proper. We have approval through the Department of Ecology to take um, from tribal land to state land, um, and, and that's how it's regulated. Um, my second question is about the VEDA zone treatment. What kind of treatment is provided in the VEDA zone? Well, assuming that the MBR doesn't take care of it, you could get additional reduction of BOD, suspended solids, et cetera, like you would in the field. Uh, certainly, there's some things that would not necessarily be treated. So, for the protection of the groundwater and actually the protection of the tribe. So, if somebody's asking the question, are you protecting the groundwater? Yes, but it's at the end of the plant. And we're not relying upon the Veto Zone 
for any additional treatment, even though we are getting some. If that answers the question, probably not. I guess, but your point of your point of compliance is that the interface between the beta zone and the groundwater. Is that what I understood? Once the once the reclaimed water trickles through, eighty to one hundred and sixty feet of soil, and then re-enters the waters of the United States, that is the point of compliance. Okay, but you're so, okay. Thank so you, you get you get treatment both at the plant, and any additional treatment that you may need in the beta. Okay, we have time for a couple of quick questions before we go to break. So go ahead, Chris. I am Chris Stoll with Kennedy Jenks. Um, I'm wondering what analysis or demonstration to, did you do to make sure that the treatment process was going to meet primary drinking water standards before you went into construction? Uh, we had had uh, actually quite a bit of data from other MBR plants that were under the same uh, jurisdiction, primarily the Tulalip tribes. So the Tulalip tribes that started their MBR plant in 2003 uh, using the same uh, process, same flat plate membranes. So there was uh, a lot of confidence that, in flat fact, the effluent would be consistent with that process. So we, we used an operating plant. So the Tulalip um, plant measures primary drinking water standards on a regular basis? It's under the same rules and regulations. It has to meet the same standards. Hi, Amber, this question's for you. Um, my name is Ryan Vogel with Pure Blue Tech. I'm interested in membrane fouling from an operational and economic perspective. Um, what's, the, what's the economic cost of having to do the six-month CIP? And if, if there were a way to reduce that by half or even eliminate it, would that really make a big difference? Because you noted there's redundancy in some of the systems. So yeah, what's, what's the... The implication of the balance. So, for we order two drums at a time to do both trains, um, and it costs about five hundred dollars every six months. So that is pretty minimum economic impact to our operation. Um, a lot of older plants do have to increase the cleaning uh, frequency, but so far, I mean, we're in almost six years and we're still at every six months so that it's minimal to us but that's great is, is there any issue with um, disposal of the chemicals no so we already use sodium hypochlorite as a secondary disinfection as well after uv so what we do with anything that's left over is just pump it into the disinfection system all right, thank you, Mike, Amber, and Hero. Um, so we have a short break before our next session at 11.15. Um, also give them a round of applause. We haven't done that yet. Yeah, thank you presenters. So if you, are, if you are heading to a different session, please don't forget your CEU sheet. Amanda has those for you by the door um, and we'll see you in a few minutes. <laughs>